Welcome to the Powerlifting America podcast. Today, we're going to do the recap show for Powerlifting America Classic <clears throat> Open Nationals 2023 in Austin, Texas. And I got the crew back with me. We got Marcus McFadden, the 83 kilo junior. We've got Julia Williams, the 63 kilo open lifter. And we've got Sam Sakura, Slam and Sammy Sakura over here, the 105 kilo junior as well. And oh, Marcus is actually a sub junior for one more year. So um, he's the problem child of Powerlifting America. All right. Um, to start off with, we're going to get right into this. To, I want to start off with just a little disclaimer, which is that um, we're the, on the media team of Power of Team America. So we are not the head coaches of the U.S. Open team. So anything we say here is not official. Um, the Only the U.S. Open coaches, Mike Zolinski and Rodney Elm, will be making the choice of who's going to open Classic Worlds in Malta this year. But we might have a little bit of speculation. We will have Mike Z, Killer Mike Z, on the podcast later this week to talk about, you know, the alternate pool and where the Carpinos are and all of that kind of stuff, All uh, something official from the executive director and the head coach himself. But um, for this episode, we're just, uh, well, this is just sports talk from uh, four people from the media team of Power Within America. We're not on the board. We're not on the executive committee. So none of this is official. So don't hold us accountable for any of this. Um, all right. And, um, we want to go ahead and like, just get right into this. We don't want to keep, make this a long drawn out episode. So we're going to go session by session. We're going to start off with, um, at the beginning with the 47 kilo weight class, we had ourselves an epic battle here between Jessica Espinal and Heather Connor. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to our panel here to discuss the results. Go ahead. Slam and Sammy. Uh, yeah, this was awesome. Um, you know, it was in the warm up room. I noticed that, you know, Heather seemed to be at least somewhat still injured. Um, and she pushed through what she was able to push through on that day. Um, but her warm ups did look a little bit concerningly different than they typically did. And we kind of saw them on the platform as well. Um, and we saw Jessica come kind of come out full force on the day. Uh, so Jessica took that early lead and then she really built her lead on bench. She ended up benching an American record. On her third attempt, uh, she did have a solid suspense for a little bit. She did uh, get her, uh, she did fail her first bench, and it looked like it was on potentially strength. But uh, she just tweaked some things, easily smacked it for a second, then went up and then took the American record on her third. And then Jessica, from there on out, all she had to do was just make her attempts to make a, make her lead so uncomfortably large that Heather would have to put something way too big on the day uh, in order to win. And that's what she did. Jessica went three for three on deadlifts, ended with a 385-pound deadlift. 125 kilos and she made her lead uh much too big for heather to um to come and jessica ended up closing it out but uh, it was definitely a good battle and you know i'm sad we didn't see heather at 100 percent because i think it would have been even closer but it was still one of the best battles of the meet yeah really good point there um we saw heather in the warm-up room in advance and um you know spoiler alert we did press conferences for everyone um, um, for, for a lot of the lifters after the fact, and she talked about it and she did have a serious, uh, injury that happened, uh, right at the beginning of the meet. And that definitely put her in some serious pain that made it difficult to brace against, um, her belt and everything. So she definitely dropped some openers, go listen to the press conference. You'll hear the full story. Um, she goes all into detail about what happened, um, and how it affected her performance. Um, but, uh, Julia, what did you think about this one? Yeah, so, I mean, this was one of my favorite battles. Um, it was just, you know, every lift was important, I think. Um, it was really, so Heather missed her third squat, and, you know, we thought, okay, um, you know, Jessica's going to take this, this is her time. Um, and then she came out and and missed her first bench, and that was a lot of drama. But, um, I mean, in the end, um, I think that that was more of a... Um, kind of lift off and bar path issue, even though it looked like strength, um, because she was able to come back and get her second and third and yeah, just put it out of reach. Um, it's unfortunate that um, Heather was injured. Uh, she's a great lifter um, and she has to push through a lot, you know, like she has a lot of um, injuries and, and things that um, would, keep somebody who's less determined back, I think. Um, but, you know, kudos to her for pushing through and still hitting a pretty massive total. So yeah, I really enjoyed that battle. For sure. I mean, the crowd when, uh, when Jessica missed her first bench was just like, it was like a hush went over the crowd and everyone was, it, it was, everyone was nervous for a minute. Um, and again, we did a press conference with Jessica. It's up on YouTube. Now you can go listen to it. She talked about exactly what happened. 
Um, and so we won't go into too much detail of it here, but needless to say her and her coach and her whole team that she had back there with her, they got it figured out, came out, smoked her second, smoked her third, looked like she still had plenty left on her third on bench. So it's exciting to see where she'll go from here. Um, oh, Marcus, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, and I just want to like preface this by saying that there are going to be like a few gaps in my knowledge, uh, especially for like this first session, because I wasn't able to really view it live. But I do know that with this specific battle um, about, you know, Jessica and Heather, that it was going to be a tight one. It was going to be one that, you know, the entire community was really excited for. And I just feel like this is going to be a sort of, I wouldn't call it a precedent, but a kind of uh, tradition that you'll see commonly at this level where, you know, it's all about hitting those lifts. And you're definitely going to get snuck up on if you're not hitting those lifts. So it was extremely, uh, yeah, like you, like Julia said, it was extremely dramatic when she missed that first bench. But with deadlifts, she just needed to hit those lifts and put the her total in a place that was just not really in the scope, in the field that uh, Heather Connor could have made it comfortable for her. Um, but overall, um, I wouldn't say that I'd be the person to have the most um, educated and like intellectual discussions about this first session because I just wasn't there but I do know that uh, it was a really good battle and I saw the clips of it and I am extremely uh, proud of the performance that went on and you know I wish the best of luck to Heather with her recovery and you know she's a lot better of a person than I would have been because you know apparently it was before weigh-ins I would have just quit at that point yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing you and Julia really nailed it that um, a lesser determined person could have easily pulled out of this meet with the kind of situation that she was dealing with. Um, she had, she faced a lot of adversity on the day, in fact. Um, and of course, I mean, she missed three lifts, which I don't think is very common for Heather Connor and um, still kept it pretty close and still was kind of challenging. And, you know, with the big deadlift that she has, like she was keeping Jessica on her toes throughout. So even though um, she missed some lifts and wasn't hundred percent, she definitely, you know, still forced Jessica to have a really good day in order to beat her. Um, and so that was, that was really fantastic. I think if we look in, um, at worlds, we'll compare some of these to worlds, what happened this last year, worlds 2022 in South Africa. And, um, if, if Jessica had put up this number 408, it would have been good for a silver medal. Um, Tiff did do 426.5 at worlds. So Tiff is still a ways out there, but I know that Jessica was dealing with some quad strain coming into this and her training wasn't hundred percent on point coming in, coming into this meet. Obviously she's dealing with the new bench rules, which was a, a big thing for her to kind of figure out exactly where her bench would be. And it looked like on her third bench that she had a ton left. It actually looked like, you know, she squatted an American, she squatted a national record um, as well. So, I mean, I think all three of her lifts are going really good. She's obviously got a really good training staff behind her with the strength guys. So I think this 408 is probably the lowest total we're going to see from her in a while. And so I think she's going to start pushing up into those, you know, up into the upper four four teens and um, possibly challenging Turbo Tiff there at 426.5. Um, we'll also see, you know, if Tiff decides to stay there or if she's going to go up or who knows what the case may be, but we'll cover that when we lead into a, a world's preview show out. Um, anyone have any final thoughts on this one? Sammy got anything else? No, I think we covered it all. Yeah. Um, uh, definitely go listen to the press conference, especially, um, I think you'll hear Jesse, Jessica Espinal, man. She's, she's a character. She's super smart. She speaks really well. Um, so we, we got a superstar on the rise here in the 47 so that can challenge, um, at the world level. So I'm really excited to see what the future holds. All right, let's move on over to the 52s. Um, big uh, drama here in that Megan Hurlbert did not make weight. Um, we talked about it on the preview show. King of Lifts talked about it on the preview show that it might be difficult for, for Megan to make weight. Um, she did lift, lift as a guest lifter anyway and put up a 445, which if you want to go look at what that would have done at Worlds last year, it would have won Worlds by like seven kilos. So Megan Hurlbert is an absolute phenom on the rise here. She's super strong. If she can get the weight cut down, it's going to be uh, it's it's going to be a big battle between her and like who's basically become the goat of the 52s and Noemi Alibear at the world level. So, but the two lifters who did make weight, Jamie Fisher and Kate Cohen, uh, Jamie Fisher took it. Kate Cohen came in second and let's pop it over to Sam again on this one. Um, what are your thoughts on this weight class? 
Uh, yeah, you know, it's a shame we didn't get to see Megan compete in her weight class because it would have been awesome to see um, that performance had it uh, counted as a 52. But uh, Jamie won on the day. Um, I thought that, I, I mean, you could tell that it probably was not um, the best day for her. You know, going five for nine is definitely not ideal. Uh, she did take that American record bench on her second attempt. Um, but overall, um, you know, I thought the attempt selection potentially wasn't the best. Um, and that might have led to leaving some kilos out of the total, but she did end up totally enough uh, to win. Uh, Kate Cohen and her had identical squats, but then from there, Jamie's bench uh, propelled her much above. And then from there, Kate Cohen's deadlift was much greater. Uh, we didn't see Kate load up anything outrageous for the win, uh, which was intriguing, but uh, Kate did play it safe and went three for three on her deadlifts to end the day with a very nice total as well. But um Ultimately, you know, it wasn't as exciting as it could have been, but uh, it, w- it was still a great battle between Jamie and Kate. Yeah, definitely Jamie missing some lifts. Um, you know, she missed four lifts. Kate missed three lifts. So um, it, it kind of became a battle of attrition a little bit on, on that front. Um, Julia, what do you think about this one? So um, I was there uh, watching in the audience. I didn't realize that Megan missed weight at first. So I thought... Um, you know, like she's running away with it. Um, but she missed weight by quite a bit. And I, I had a chance to talk to her at the barbecue and, um, she, it it wasn't that it was, um, out of reach for her to cut to this weight class. Um, she just had, um, sometimes, you know, like the flight or something. I, I think she actually drove in, but, um, for whatever reason, the weight wasn't coming off as um, it normally would have. And so she just decided to stop forcing it. Um, I don't know, she thought it was abnormal. So I think that, you know, she could definitely make weight as a 52, Um, but nonetheless, I mean, she put up an amazing total. Um, Monster. Yeah, and I think if she she does make the 52 weight class in the future, she's going to be forced to be reckoned with. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, um, not that much to say here. Um, Jamie Fisher, she always has a great bench and squad. Um, she struggled a little on deadlift. I was really impressed with, uh, uh, Kate Cohn on her, her deadlift. I had no idea, um, that she had that strong of a deadlift. That was really, that was wild. So, um, yeah, I mean, this could have been, potentially a little bit more um, exciting, but you know, what happened happened. And I think that everyone put up, you know, pretty, pretty good totals. Um, So it should be an exciting class in the future. Absolutely. All right, Marcus, over to you, brother. Yeah. um, Initially I was really surprised with um, Megan and the fact that she missed weight because I remember Chance was talking on like the King of Lewis podcast about how, you know, oh, it was going to be a breeze and how uh, cutting for her is, you know, completely on track. So obviously, first speculations are just something abnormal happened, which, you know, things do happen. So, you know, I don't really have much of the info on that. I just uh, found it quite surprising. But overall, um, it was it was a very decent battle. Um, like Sam said, it you know, was something that was interesting to me because when you're in that tight of a position, say for instance, like uh, you're Kate Cohn in that uh, situation and you're going, you know, your deadlifts are flying and yet you still don't try to load something up for that third, you know, especially because, you know, those totals were really uh, tight right at the end. And especially going into those deadlifts with, the momentum that uh, Jamie didn't really hold on to, you know, missing those benches. But um, yeah, I found it an interesting fight. And, you know, overall, um, I don't really have much else to say. Yeah, I mean, we should mention that Kate Cohen PR'd her total, you know. So um, this is a new PR total for her. Her training was on fire going into this. You know, she's coached by Marisa Enda and Juggernaut team. So they had a good showing. I mean, if they could just, you know, get a couple more lifts in, you know, get her third squat and get an extra another bench. She only got one bench in. I mean, she's she'd be right there knocking on the door of of going into the 400 kilo plus range. Um, Kate and, and we should also mention that Kate and Jamie 
both came in light. They both laid, weighed in in the upper 50 kilo range. Um, so they weren't even 51 kilos. They weren't even up into the upper 51 kilos, anything like that. So they definitely have room to grow. And Kate stays around that weight and training. So she's not cutting or anything. So I'm really excited to see, you know, I think the future is bright for Kate Cohen. She's a super smart person. She's getting her PhD and stuff like this. Um, Jamie also is super smart. She's like in genetics and stuff like this. So this is a really fun weight class. It'll be fun to see whenever Megan comes back and we'll see. Um, again, we're not, we, we don't know officially anything, but, um, we'll see if Megan can get on to one, uh, a national team of some sort. Maybe it won't be the world's team, but maybe the NAPF team or something like this, um, with her performance here, or maybe she has to do another meet. I'm not sure exactly what the case may be, but, um, it, I'm re really, really can't wait to see her redeem herself. And the story's not over for Megan Herbert. It's just getting started. So I'm pumped for the future of this weight class for us. Um, anything else you want to add, Sam, you got any other, uh, inside knowledge on any of that? All right. Okay. Um, the last women's division that we had in session one, I mean, and as you can see, this has been a, this is a stacked session. This was a super fun session. It's the 57s where we had Natalie Richards put up a ridiculous 501.5 kilo total. Just to put that in context, that 501 kilo total <clears throat> would have won open worlds in South Africa by like 20 kilos, like right around just over 20 kilos. Um, so this is a massive total. It's the biggest total in history, unofficial world record at that weight class. And um, go listen to a press conference with Natalie Richards afterwards, her and her coach, Steve Denovi talk about what went into it. Matt Gary asked a lot of great questions about this, but, um, and then we also have the comeback, comeback kid. Chrissy Max Power, Chrissy Paraki um, put up a, a, just an absolute great performance out there. And then Kay Johnson. So Sam, um, I know you were watching this one close. So let's pop it over to you again. Yeah, uh, it was just, I mean, it was an impeccable performance from Natalie. Um, you know, that's not to put Chrissy's performance in the shadows. Chrissy had an amazing day, uh, especially given what she battled through in prep. But uh, Natalie's performance was just uh, historic. And, you know, ever since she started working with Steve Novi, her training started almost immediately um, going on the up and up and she just continued to blow up. Um, she had really just come out of the scene uh, with fire and like just exploded uh, since she's only been competing for, I believe like two or so years. Um, and now she just put up the heaviest uh, drug tested 57 kg total ever. Um, her meat day execution was almost flawless as usually expected with Steve and his athletes. And uh, she needed that uh, to go over the 500 kg mark for sure. And she uh, did that even with missing her third bench. Um, I'll be very interested to see how Worlds goes this year. But I think uh, Natalie's total is definitely a warning shot to every 57 kg in the world right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and go ahead, Julia. Yeah, I mean, you're Natalie. Um, she's the first uh, 57 to total over 500 kilos. Um, Great performance. Um, I'd expect nothing less from her. Um, she did in the press conference say that she actually had to tempo her first deadlift because she was scared that um, she would pull it too fast and get called for um, downward motion or soft lockout. I can't um, quite remember. So um, yeah, I mean, that was, in, that was, you know, she, she's, she's right up there. I mean, she's, Worlds is going to be exciting, um, and uh, yeah, there's there's not much to say about that. Um, Christina, I know she was going through a lot. Um, she has you know various injuries, and she just keeps coming back and putting over putting up um, great performance after great performance. Um, so they were both really fun to watch. Um, and then Kay, um, I don't I didn't know much about her um, going into this meet. Um, I don't know quite what happened during bench. Um, there were there were some interesting calls there. Um, her benches look good. Um, you know they got red lighted, so uh, there's that. But you know overall on the day, um, Natalie Richards is just she's untouchable um, in uh, domestically as a 57, and I think that she has a very good chance of uh, dominating at Worlds too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, absolutely amazing performance from Natalie Historic. Go ahead, Marcus. <clears throat> um, yeah, sure. Just to uh, kind of, you know, capitalize off of what Julia was saying here, I wouldn't exactly even consider that, you know, she would 
beat most of the international lifters. She would be putting herself, you know, in really uncharted territory um, as a 57. I just feel like her performance is definitely going to be something to remember. Um, I mean, you can't just put something up like that, uh, just something that is just, you know, outrageous and just a historic moment as a lifter to be the first one to do something and not really be, you know, talked about. It, it It's definitely one of the, the biggest moments of session one um, as a whole. And, you know, not to really, you know, put aside the other lifters who competed in their class. You know, I think they did a phenomenal job. But, you know, when you have an individual who, you know, starts working with someone like Steve Denovi and just starts, you know, going off. And as Sam says, with training, firing on all cylinders. Um, and you just put up such a huge number like that in competition. I mean, this momentum is definitely going to be riding uh, into worlds here. And I think that she's going to do a phenomenal thing. And that's definitely going to be something that, you know, I'm going to be watching. Yeah. And um, we, this is our first time for our powerlifting America family to really get to know Steve Denovi um, and uh, get to see him behind the scenes and how he operates. And I have to say, um, you know, he, he comes off on the podcast, you know, is like very outgoing and all of this, but in the warm up room, he told me coming into this, that like his, he's a different person on, on when he's coaching his athletes, he's hyper focused on being the best coach in the world. Um, and that really came across in the warm up room that he was basically like this very chilled out, calm guy that was watching very closely his athletes. Um, very nice to be around. Um, it, a lot different than the personality that you'll see on the podcast. Um, in the sense of um, just super focused on his athletes and doing anything for them. So, and then you'll hear him talk on the pod, on the on the um, press conference just about what all went into this prep and everything like that. And I think he really, um, you know, he came across. He handled himself extremely well as a coach, and I think it showed in his in it, both of his athletes' performance in this session between Natalie and Waskar. So I think uh, it was cool to meet Steve, and it was great to see how he operated back there. Um, I also just want to say one more thing about Chrissy Max Power. Um, <clears throat> she put up a 440 while having a back injury. Um, that's only five kilos short of her best total, and uh, you know, and I can tell you that. She she talks about this in her press conference as well. Make sure you go out and check out all the press conferences that we did. They're all up on YouTube. Um, but she she for sure after she got her first squat, she came off and she's like, "Oh, it's on today!" Like she was feeling great. And so I think um, she talking to her afterwards in the press conference and just hanging out with her throughout the weekend. Um, she's hyped up and ready to go. I mean, she's talking like if she doesn't make it on the U.S. national team for for Worlds, that she'll probably go to NAPF and kick some ass down in the Cayman Islands. And um, I'm really excited to see where the future is for Chrissy, Chrissy Paraki. Um, she's definitely not she's not done by any stretch of the imagination. And she's put up these numbers here to, with being fairly injured still coming into this training wasn't really on point because of a back injury. So um, I'm really excited to see also, you know, what she can do in this weight class as well. She's also big killer. Mike Z has been trying to convince her to do some equipped lifting, uh, which he does. If you ever get around him, he will always try to convince you to go and put on a bench shirt because she's got a massive bench. Um, and so, he, you know, it would be really exciting to see what she could do with that as well. So I'm really happy for Power Team America. I think um, in this session, you know, we got to see, Steve Denovi, an amazing coach. We got to see Chrissy. We got to see um, Natalie Richards, who came over. You know, and I just think that our team on Powerlifting America is just getting stronger every every day that goes by. We're getting stronger and stronger, and um, we're becoming a more formidable team when we're going to go in, over into the World Championships and on all of our national teams. So I'm super pumped for that. Um, all right, is there any final thoughts you want to say on the the women's side? Otherwise, let's move over to the men's side. Um, that we had in session one. And again, just thinking of like how stacked this session was, um, we're going to pop it over to the men's 59 kilo class where we saw the powerlifting America nationals debut of Waskar Carpio. And um, this man is like a machine again, coached by Steve Denovi. We got to see Steve, you know, he's like a handler of the gods back there, like with these two athletes that he had. And um, he really pulled the best out of both of his athletes. They both only missed one lift. And Waskar put up a ridiculous 613 kilo total. Um, and, you know, the world records are what they are because of Sergei Fedoshenko. But if we put this in the context of, uh, uh, or, or wait, uh, Waskar, yeah, do you put up a 613.5 kilo total? Yes. 
I'm sorry. Oh, yes, he did. And then uh, if we look at this in the context of worlds, I'm sorry, I was looking at the, his, this total so high. I was looking at the 66 kilos in South Africa, but this would have been good enough for first place at worlds this last year in South Africa by something like 50 kilos. Um, so if now that Wasker has handled his business, he's punched his ticket, he hit the qualifying total, he would go to worlds. It's only a question of if Sergey will be there or not. Otherwise, it doesn't look like anyone in the world can challenge Wasker Carpio. So, um, and then we also had Dalton Lako um put up a huge battle, 58 587.5. I think he surprised everyone keeping it that close. Um, for people who didn't know him because he doesn't post his lifts anywhere, he kept it super close. But um, yeah, and then we had David Berube. Um, the, he was the first special Olympics athlete to compete in full power for power team America. So a special story there, um, coached by Ellis McLean. So definitely want to go check him out and watch the, he was definitely a crowd favorite. He buries his squats like to the ground. Um, so you'll see some fun lifts there. He got super hyped up for his deadlifts. It was a great, great feel good story to watch him lifting, but all right. Um, Sam, what'd you think about the performance here that Waskar and team P PR's performance put up? Another great performance from him. Uh, you know, he what I think I believe he loaded that third deadlift to uh, I think it was to match Charlie Yang's total or beat it. Mm -hmm. uh, sick. Uh, you know, he was pretty close. Uh, so I have no doubt he'll iron that out in the future. But uh, he was just the executioner on the day. He took everything that was there, and Stephen him made sure to take numbers that were well within reach and executed the highest standard. Uh, it was cool actually to see Dalton end up pulling uh, the American record deadlift on his second. And because Wasker uh, failed his third, Dalton, I believe, now owns the uh, 59 kg uh, American record deadlift, which is sick. Uh, it was cool to see him compete. Uh, and it's also really cool to see Dalton's uh, deadlift in person. He is uh, very well leveraged for the deadlift. And that was definitely cool. Um, but overall, uh, yeah, what Wasker did was pretty crazy. And I think. You know, hearing and talking to him about how like dialed he and he is with literally every single aspect that a lifter could have dialed in, uh, it, it's very evident um, when you see him compete, and I think it was really cool. Yeah, and uh, if you you know, we also interviewed uh, Waskar coming into this, and so definitely if you're not familiar with his story, go back and listen to it. But and you can hear Steve talk about it as well um, on the Two White Lights podcast that th this guy is just a machine. Like he doesn't miss a meal. He doesn't, he doesn't cheat meals. He doesn't miss a session. And so when he says he's coming for Sergey's numbers and Charlie Yang's numbers first, and then, and then Sergey's numbers, I mean, we better believe him. Julia, what do you think about this one? Yeah. I mean, um, Waskar did what Waskar yeah. does. Um, and you know, he, he hit the Carpino total. Um, he even pulled, I think, for 10 kilos more than that on his third and didn't quite get it. Um, but yeah, he's, I mean, the sky's the limit for him. Um, this is, you know, one meet, I think, under Stephen Ovi, maybe two. Um, mm -hmm. And um, he's improved massively every time. Um, he really seems to be 100% um, committed to hitting his goals. And um he's going to do, he's going to do really well. Um, I definitely think that if anyone can catch, uh, certain numbers in the 59s, it's, it's him, you know? Um, so that should be good. Um, and then Dalton, I was really impressed. Um, I did not think it was going to be, he was going to be this close and he actually pulled, um, he tried for 270, which is just, um, <laughs> crazy at 59 kilos um and uh yeah I mean that would have given him a 597 total which is actually not far off of the Carpino so um yeah that was really fun to watch and then David just looked like he was having so much fun like it was um it was really cool to see like you when a lifter is having fun like that it's kind of infectious and um yeah it just that was a really uh phenomenal session to watch yeah, for sure. And I mean, being coached by Ellis McLean, he's always having the most fun of anyone in the room. Um, and so definitely the two of them together, it was, it was really fun to watch. Go ahead, Marcus. What'd you think of this session or this, uh, weight class? Yeah. Um, coming into this, I, you know, being, you know, on like the newer side of lifting, um, you know, you don't really hear much about, you know, up and coming names, uh, such as, you know, Waskar. Um, so, you know, someone like me, I had to do my research, 
And, you know, seeing someone like this actually perform is honestly insane. He did something that, uh, you know, will will be, you know, you know, pushing down territory that, you know, not many people can say that they have. He did, you know, he performed extremely well. And it was, you know, once again, like a, a tighter battle than most thought. But I think that, you know, Waskar, he just put down a very solid performance with very little flaws, very little issues and uh, very little concerns that I just feel like when you're in that kind of mindset as a lifter is uh, that kind of momentum that you you ride. And, you know, it's something that, you know, you just can't you can't like mix up. That's it's not a it's hard to explain, really, but mm -hmm. it's everyone who has competed understands that when you are just so, so dialed in to the extent that, you know, everything is 110 percent that it's not something that is easily taken up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we're getting to witness greatness here when you're talking about Waskar and especially with this smart, smart decision to hire Steve as his coach. Um, I think we're witnessing something that's going to be very historic here. Uh, Waskar is a great guy. He's a family man. You know, he's got a young son. Um, his wife sits in the front row, you know, at two competitions. Now I've been there with him. And um, just seeing him, you know, he's a family man. He's a biz he's a professional in his day life. He just handles business like a true pro and a really good guy and extremely disciplined. And I, I think he's 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 the machine and he's not going to nothing is going to get in his way of performing um, when it when it counts the most. And so I'm, I'm super happy for him to kind of get these numbers. Um, it wasn't a stretch. His last deadlift, he locked it out. It just had a little bit of up and down motion. Um, it almost just had a little bobble at the top is all it was. And he would have locked that out and he would have secured the the biggest total ever as by an American at that weight class. And I think he'll definitely do that um, if it's necessary at Worlds. Looking at, again, looking at the roster at Worlds, um, it's all a matter of if Sergey's coming or not. If Sergey's not there, he's going to cruise. And um, he ought to be, he won't really be challenged. And so he ought to be able to um, YOLO that third deadlift and really like go for some big numbers. Cause as long as he gets his openers, he'll probably handily get the gold medal for team USA, help us win the team points, which we didn't even have a 59 last year. Um, so this is a, you know, a, an extra gold medal that we'll be adding, um, you know, which we obviously swept, you know, team USA swept both sides on team points. Um, so looking, looking like very strong for team USA, we got a real one here and it's cool to have uh, Steve Denovi, you know, in our camp with a couple great lifters as well. So I'm really excited for what the future may hold there. Um, all right. Again, this is a stacked session. So let's move on to the next weight class that's in the session. Uh, we have the 66 kilo men. And again, we had a historic performance here. Um, so we have Brian Lee totaled 713.5. And if I'm looking at what happened at Worlds last year in the 66, Eddie Berglund totaled 710 to win the gold medal for, for uh, Sweden. And so if Brian could put up this kind of performance, it looks like he'll be good <coughs> for another gold medal. I also, if I'm looking here for the total world record is a 710.5. So Eddie was half a kilo short of that at Worlds in South Africa. Brian unofficially hits above the, uh, the world record with his 713.5. Obviously punched his ticket to Malta for Team USA, made the U.S. national team. He was in a battle, a three-way battle here with Jonathan Garcia and Rodrigo Manzo. So I'll let you talk about it, Sam. Go ahead. Um, well, it was actually just a two-way battle uh, because he was total zero kg. Um, I can't say that I was completely shocked by Rodrigo totaling that, given that I didn't really see him ever using his hands to pull deadlift string prep. Um, but you know, it is sad to see that because you know he definitely has the potential to be back battling with the top uh, eventually. But he definitely has to tweak his training if he wants to do that. Uh, you know, two for nine is definitely uh, pretty, pretty much the bottom in terms of being ideal. But Brian Jonathan's battle was interesting. Uh, I think it would have been a lot more interesting had Jonathan Garcia been able to sink those squats, uh, you know, getting a second and third called on death. Uh, you know, it, it's hard. It was hard to tell death uh, if he was hitting it in his training and he doesn't post that much training. So, um, but, you know, I think he usually has been able to turn on and meet, you know, he literally he squatted the world record last year at Worlds. So, you know, I'm not sure what happened there, but because Jonathan missed his second and third squats, it gave Brian – um, a much more comfortable road to the total that he hit. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see if there will be any 66s that will push Brian at Worlds. 
But uh, Brian had a historic day. Um, you know, he got his second squat called on death, but then he just retook it for his third. He smoked it. Um, and then, you know, he, he, he said that in the press conference that he has to tweak some um, things on the standard and training on squat and bench. So I think if he does that, he's probably going to total even more uh, come meet day in Malta. And then Brian's death was outstanding. He finally pulled 700, above 700 in a meet. Um, and he went three for three on pulls, pulling American record. And to give him the uh, total record and unofficial total world record with 713. Uh, Brian really, he ended up cruising to that total. Uh, I wish it was a little bit closer, but it was still um, really awesome to watch in person, especially his pulls. Yeah, another amazing lifter. Um, this is his debut at Nationals for Power 15 America. So we got another ringer here that's going to go to Worlds and, and probably win. Julia, what do you think about this one? Yeah, I mean, I thought, um, you know, uh, with squats, um, I didn't really, after squats, um, I didn't really know what was going to happen with um, Brian missing on depth. And I don't know if Jonathan also missed on depth. Um, I, I can't exactly um, remember, but it was really up in the air um, pretty much, you know, until until deadlifts and then, and then uh, Brian pulled away. Um, I think he was having a little bit of trouble with his bench. He um, hit a little bit lower than he had in training and he scratched his third, but um, nonetheless, he was able to put up, you know, um, just an historic total. Um, so, I mean, that was really fun to watch. Um, and it looks like he has, you know, he, he picked the right coach and he has a uh, good chemistry with Joe and he looked like he was having a lot of fun and it's, it's good to see him, um, you know, hit, do what he was capable of. Um, Jonathan, uh, he just, I think he, he just struggled a little bit. I think, you know, he, he, um, he sinks his bench and I don't know, um, Rodrigo does this too. And, you know, when you do that, there is some, um, you can get called for for various things um but yeah I mean it he just wasn't um he just wasn't quite uh there uh to challenge Brian in a in a significant way um when it came to deadlifts and then <clears throat> Sam said with Rodrigo um just you know if you if you train with straps um and you pull hook you know things are gonna happen so uh, there's not much to say. Rodrigo has uh, mentioned on his Instagram that he is going to um, change a lot of things. So I think going forward, this could uh, potentially be a true three-way battle again. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, Rodrigo basically lives in the gym. I mean, he is tra he's training all the time. So he's a strong guy. He's just got to like, you know, get to the standard on this stuff. Marcus, go ahead. So the initial conceptualized battle between like uh, Brian and Jonathan here, you know, boiled down to whether or not Jonathan could have hit a good enough subtotal to really put Brian in an uncomfortable position for his deadlifts. But the thing is, uh, that's not what happened. And, you know, Jonathan got, you know, called out for his, you know, his squats in the bench and just didn't put the subtotal where it needed to be. Uh, which gave, you know, Brian a full lane uh, to really go all in for his deadlifts. And, you know, Brian did, you know, phenomenal things, you know, unprecedented territory here. And, you know, for Rodrigo, I mean, there's good days, but with every good day, there's always a bad day to come after that. And if a lifter is willing to admit to their faults and be like, yeah, I did not do well, and there's going to be a lot of things I'm going to change. And that is something that, you know, I can respect. Uh, I, it, it, I find it hard to, to respect someone who has like a poor performance and then refuses to fix their training. Um, but once again, you know, it was a battle that had uh, was it, it about it was a battle that came down to whether or not, you know, Jonathan could have hit that subtotal, but it just wasn't there that day. Yeah. Um, you know, Jonathan's a, a like, he, he's an Olympic weightlifting athlete before. I mean, he, he's a, he's a legit athlete. So he's going to obviously shrug this off and move on and get his training back. He's got a great coach in Arian coaching him and everything. Um, so he'll be back for sure. There's no question. I'm sure this will just light a fire under him for sure. 
um him and him and brian almost could like win the contest for the most soft-spoken guys in the warm-up room um they're both they're both very quiet dudes i didn't get to hear anything from jonathan about exactly what was up he didn't do a press conference afterwards um as to what he uh what what was going on with his squad it was obvious though that you know he missed he only made one squat and that that's his biggest weapon um he also has a huge bench you know and he only made two of those so he's got to go six for six going into deadlifts in order to put up something uh, in order to really challenge someone like Brian, who's got a massive deadlift. But if we just look at the numbers, um, he did out total Brian on squat by 10 kilos and he did out total him on bench by 20 kilos. So he had a 30 kilo lead heading into deadlift, but you know, um, Brian out, out totaled on openers by 60 kilos on deadlift, you know, open 60 kilos heavier on deadlift. So that lead was erased immediately with openers. And from there, it was just kind of like, um, how far could Brian really push things and him and his coach did a great job. Brian is self coached by the way. Um, definitely. If you go, go listen to his, uh, quick check-in podcast episode that we did with him beforehand, you get a l- to know him a little bit. We'll definitely have him on the podcast again for a more in-depth story going into worlds, going into Malta as he obviously punched his ticket for that. Um, but he's self coached but he had Joe Stanek back there helping him. And then the game day crew was kind of warming up with the, the, uh, Steve Denovi crew and stuff. So like, they just had a very good team around them back there in the warm up room. I think Charlie Yang was even back there helping. Um, and so like, they just had a, a, a really great team put that threw down a, a massive performance. And so couldn't be happier for Brian also would we'll just mention that Brian and Jessica are both juniors. Um, they're both, uh, this would be Brian's, I believe it's his last year as a junior and Jessica's got a couple more years as junior. So the future is looking really bright with these two, with these two young, super young lifters, um, getting, making the qualifying total, making it on us national team to go to worlds in Malta. So super excited for what the future holds there. Um, all right, let's move on. The last session of this, uh, uh the last weight class of this session is a 74 kilo men. And if you listen to the podcast, you heard Taylor Atwood saying he was definitely going to come and definitely lift. I spoke to him before he had a, just a, a little bit of like some, uh, some slight injury things that cropped up after traveling. He actually came with the intention of, of, uh, of lifting and everything like that. And then just had like, uh, some, some nagging things that didn't quite heal up in, in time for him to be a hundred percent and feel comfortable going out there and putting his body on the line before having to go and do Sheffield a month later. So he decided to pull out. He did join Ryan Lapidat on the commentary, hung out all weekend, you know, took selfies with everything, like was a true showman, um, was a true ambassador of the sport. Like we always expect Taylor Atwood to be. Um, I think Marcus wrote in the caption that he was going to come and parade his kingdom and uh, that he, that he did, he, the King came and paraded around his kingdom was in the warm up room. You know, do I, I saw him at the bar one time, like for breakfast in the morning, talking to like one of the junior 84 kilo lifters, you know, just, he's, he's a great ambassador of sport did gave his time to everyone. So generously um, came to the Laco barbecue and everything like that. So um, it was wonderful to have him there. Sadly, we didn't have him on the platform. Um, but we did have Nick Ferrison and Logan Dwyer. So go ahead and uh, give your summary of this one there, Sam. They, they both went nine for nine, you know, great performances. So go ahead, Sam. Yeah, both of them are great performances. You know, Ferrison total 665. Uh, he had a perfect meet day. Um, so he's your national champ. Uh, you know, there's not there's not too much analysis to be done. Uh, there wasn't much competition between Ferrison and Dwyer. But, uh, you know, it was definitely interesting to have a new 74 national champion uh, but yeah, you know, there's not, not too much you can say, um, other than congratulations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Congratulations to our gold and silver medalists, uh, Nick and Logan, uh, it, Julia or Marcus, you guys get anything you want to add to this one? Um, no, I was actually, um, really impressed with, uh, Nicholas. I thought, you know, he, um, he hit some big numbers and it was fun to watch, obviously. Um, it would have been really cool to see Taylor lift, but he made a smart decision um, on not doing that um, five weeks out from Sheffield when he has a knee injury. So um, yeah, that's it for me. All right, Marcus. Um, yeah, I, I feel like there's there's not really much that can be added that hasn't really already been spoken on here. Um, I enjoyed you know listening to Taylor Atwood's commentary on the streams. Um, I thought that, you know, he's always going to be a fan favorite no matter what happens. And I feel like at that level, it, it's small nagging injuries can turn 
uh, you know, can show like a bad side if that's not something that you're covering. Um, but in terms of, you know, the actual performance going on here, I mean, it was not that much of a competition. Both lifters had a fantastic day going nine for nine. That's something that you, you know, always, uh, if it's in the scope of your competition going nine for nine or as close to nine for nine as possible is always uh, what you want, you know, especially if, you know, you're not really in that big of a competition uh, in terms of like against other lifters in your class. So, I mean, uh, huge congrats to both the lifters uh, for putting up, you know, very good numbers and uh, showing out, you know, especially despite the fact that like um, they were going to, come into this with the mindset that the one of the greatest powerlifters of all time was going to be a huge wall in front of them, but that wasn't the case. So for them to have that kind of uh, mental fortitude to stick around, uh, despite knowing that they would have never won if Taylor was there, uh, is something to be very uh, you know commendable. Yeah, uh, I just want to give a shout out to Rodney Elm, who coaches Nick Ferrison. Uh, Rodney is a big part of Power Up in America. He basically set up all the platforms, worked his ass off uh, the day before the meet to to get the whole warm up room set up. I mean, um, he's a hardworking dude. His his uh, gym is called Wade Strength Systems. He's also a national team coach. He's one of the two coaches that brought back the team gold medals uh, in South Africa for us, which, which was the first time that we had done that in a few years. So um, now not only is he a world level coach, but now he's got a national champion on his hands and Nick Ferrison. So I couldn't be happier for Rodney and uh, Miriam Elm who do so much for power in America. So congrats to them and their lifter. Um, all right. So let's move on to, so that was session one. Like that was an absolutely stacked session. Uh, tons of amazing things happened. Historic numbers were put up, um, and new people joining into power in America, some new stars on the rise, a bunch of young lifters and looking like team USA is going to be super strong with everyone coming out of that, that session. 